Pastor Craig. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Sally Burton. <laughs> For using titles, I'll, I'll throw it your way too. <laughs> Good morning, Paradox. Good morning. So I have a, I have a few questions All right. for you. Um, the imagery of the various artists in the film is very compelling, each giving us a different facet of the whole story. In your opinion, what is God's invitation to us as we acknowledge and live with the contradictions and, dare I say, paradoxes within the Bible? <laughs> so that's a great question. I, I remember sitting in Waneel Kim's class when I was in seminary, and he talked about how the Bible is much more like um, a collection of perspectives than it is God taking a megaphone and loudly blasting in a writer's ear each word of the Bible. Um, and when you look at Kings and Chronicles, I remember sitting in his class, and he pointed out this particular contradiction between Josiah and the, the death that happens in Kings and how it's very different than the death that happens in Chronicles with the same person. And the authors changed history because their theology changed. And so when their history no longer matched their theology, they changed their history so that way it all made sense. Um, for me, that's art. And you have these very different styles. Um, some styles may speak more to you in the film than others. Some may, you may say are better than others. Um, but that's not really the point, is to be, have better art. The point is that these are unique expressions from unique human, human beings, and only those artists from those perspectives can draw or paint exactly what they came up with. Once you start seeing the Bible that way, all of a sudden the contradictions aren't threatening, they're necessary because it's like, oh, there's more diversity of thought, there's more diversity of opinion. It's okay if I say Chronicles doesn't speak to me as much as Kings, which personally, I like kings better. Uh, it's okay to say stuff like that. Whereas before, um, if you think it's all like a spreadsheet of information about God, you have to say, well, it's all true or none of it's true. Thank you. In today's film, we saw that people's ideas about what God was like changed over time. When I was growing up, we were taught that God was the unmoved mover based on Aristotle and um, Greek philosophy. Uh, God loves us, but is not moved by humanity. So what is the value or possible gifts of wrestling with some of what is taught in Christian tradition? Yeah, I, I think it's okay to believe that God doesn't change, but human perception of God does change. Uh, I think that's really important for us to acknowledge. Um, and you can see the Bible as a giant story of developing human consciousness, right? So there are ideas they try about God, and they try and they make sense in their current context. And there's sometimes that we have to say, you know, I can understand how that made sense in their context. It doesn't really make sense in my context um, necessarily. And when you look at the Bible that way, you also realize it's not very linear. It's not like the picture of God keeps getting better all the time. There are sometimes it's three steps forward, one step backward, which is a lot like my life. And I'm going to guess your life. Well, you actually probably are just always forward. You're really crushing oh, it, yeah. Sally. <laughs> always, always had all the answers. Yes. <laughs> and I think, that, um, I, think, I think that to acknowledge that humanity is, is really comforting to me. It was very threatening at first. So if anybody feels like it's threatening, I want you to know I've been there. Um, but I've really gotten to the point where I'm comforted by it because I don't think the author of Chronicles um, was any closer to God than I am today. And that speaks to a God who is truly unmovable or truly immutable or truly sovereign or truly present everywhere, much more than the idea that God spoke to this guy who wrote Chronicles back then, and I have to trust that, otherwise I can't believe in God. So that's a much bigger picture of God. Awesome. Thank you. For most of history, theology has been written by elite, white, cisgendered men, and now there are many other voices such as blacks, feminists, queer, Latin American, and others that are able to publish their thoughts. How has encountering these different lenses through which people see, how has that affected your theology? <laughs> so to answer that question, I have to say some embarrassing things about myself. <laughs> uh, I didn't really read, not, I, I really read theologians that looked a lot like me and had a lot of the same feelings and identities as me for the majority of my life. Um, 
I mean, even up until, I mean, up until graduate level sem seminary was really the first time I started to read um, <laughs> female authors. I, I mean, it's, it's that basic and that, you know. Same here. It, it, well, and that's, that speaks to, you know, the fact that we typically have seminaries that have a lot of male professors. Um, we typically have seminaries who have a lot of cisgender professors. Like, you know, the list goes on. So they're going to assign things that speak to them, which are naturally people who look and see like them. And then it just keeps, that cycle just keeps going. Um, Maury uh, Jackson, who has spoken here several times and is a mentor of mine, was like, you have to read this list. This was, this was after I graduated from seminary. He was still assigning things, which I was like, or what? And he's like, you have to. <laughs> um, so I read it, like, I read it, and I'd have to report back to him, and um, uh, it, changed, it changed my life. That was the first time I was really reading, like, black theologians and not summaries of black theologians. Once again, very embarrassing, um, and stuff I should have been doing earlier. Um, and I, I hope that you don't hear that, like, I've solved it. There's still a lot to learn. Um, we try to bring in diversity of thought with people who speak here at Paradox who have different um, either religious traditions or backgrounds or identities, so we're not hearing the same story over and over again. Because when you look at those four paintings or drawings in that film, I hope that you can see, oh, it's better if we have all of them. Um, and if we, j yes, I like this one the best, or this one is the most inspiring to me, but it's better with all of them because they all tell us something about what happened here. Amen. So, thanks. Amen. I tried. I tried that answer. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess we'll move on to some of these questions. How can we as a society avoid a lack of perspective in the way we view God's presence today? So that's, this is one of the things that's hard about this Q&A format because I'm answering it in a vacuum. Yes. There is um, a chance that the person that wrote this feels that this is like a depraved society and that God is like very far away. And so how can we like bring that perspective back to the current society? There are other people who may be reading this and say, like, well, we hear, like, this dominant stream of Christianity that there needs to be more inclusion. It's there's someone that's probably outside of the Christian tradition that says, like, there should be more of an inclusion of greater perspective. So with a little more context, I can give a more specific answer. I'm going to go with the idea, the, the heartbeat of this question, I think, is the fact that there's this idea that, that there is a better perspective later or before us, and to really trust that there is just as much perspective about who God is today as there was at any point in history and any point in the future. And anytime someone speaks about something that is true, they are speaking about God, whether they name it with the name God or not. Um, they may use a different name for God than you. That's okay. They may, use a, they may come from a different religious tradition. The fact is, like, our Bible contains the book of 1 John, which tells us that... Um, Anyone who lives in love is living in the presence of God. I think we have to trust that as Christians. And we don't have to name it God's love in order for it to be God. It can just be love. And so anytime someone loves their spouse, they are living in the presence of God. Anytime someone loves their neighbor, they are living in the presence of God, just as much as they need to be. And if you're like, you know what, I don't get a lot of a perspective as to who God is from reading the Bible, it's okay, you can skip it. The point is to live in love because that's where God's presence is. It's not to memorize 2 Chronicles 33. Awesome, that'll, that'll preach. <laughs> Thanks. How is this 400 year period of history depicted and recorded in other non-biblical sources? I love this question. So the first, I believe the earliest extra biblical source um, that verifies something that happens is the Mesha Stele which of course is in the British Museum in London, because that's where all the things go, because of colonialism, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, anyways, the Mesha Stele actually records a battle between, I can't remember the Israelite king's name, it's in the beginning of 2 Kings, but between King Mesha uh, and the Israelites. And it tells the entire story of the same battle that's in the Bible um, from King Mesha's perspective. And when you read it, it's fascinating because they both have the same theology, which is if we're devout to God, if we are honest in our prayers, then our God will give us the victory. Now, they give their God a very different name than the Israelites, but the idea is like, we'll win in battle if we're devoted to God. Well, what's interesting is in Kings, in 2 Kings, the Israelites go to battle against King Mesha, and they're winning, and they say God's on our side, and then King Mesha sacrifices his son, 
and the, the Israelites then have to retreat because all of a sudden the power against God is too great for God to overcome, is what the Bible says, which is not a lot of theology that people here believe, right? Um, King Mesha's perspective is they won the battle because they were more devoted to God. So the, when you look at this story with both of these records, it's clear that King Mesha's side won. Um, it's clear that they both thought that God would give them the victory. Uh, I would say the Israelites kind of were at a loss for why they lost this battle. And so they tried to explain it. And the only thing they could come up with was that sometimes child sacrifice overpowers God. Um, which I'm empathetic to them saying that. And I, I don't want to, like, look back down my nose at them and say, like, oh, come on, guys, get it together. Um, this is just them trying to piece it together, which is really what the Bible is. So mm -hmm. I love this church. The fact that I can talk about the Mesha Stele is, like, <laughs> amazing. So thanks, y'all. <laughs> Do conflicting theologies of the character of God say more about God or the people who hold these theologies? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I think very basically, I think it's a great question. Um, there are times that you're like, you're making God in your own image. And there are other times you hear something and you're like, that's the God I know. Yeah. That's it. Like First John. Yep. And there's times it shows up in ex expected places. And there's times it shows up in unexpected places. And that, my friends, is the story of the Bible. What is the prevailing evangelical literist interpretation of this contradiction? They don't know it exists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that in the most condescending way. I just, uh, this is like a deep cut of scripture for all of you that like, you're like maybe saying I've heard this for the first time. This is not something that's really well known because you have to, really like pay attention in Kings and Chronicles, which I'll tell you, you get a gold star if you do that. It's, it's a lot of history to wade through. Um, most people, what's interesting is most evangelical literists would say that um, God worked primarily with the Israelites. Chronicles interpretation is that God worked primarily through Pharaoh Necho, which is just like, I mean, there's not a whole lot of biblical precedent for that where God uses the Pharaoh of Egypt as God's messenger, right? So this is a really like, I mean, this is how they got out of this. And the whole reason Chronicles got out of it is because they're like, we can't believe that God punishes kids for the sins of their parents anymore. And the reason this is happening is because Chronicles is written 300 years, after King, uh, 300 years after the life of Josiah, 200 years after Kings. And they're living in a point where they've heard that they're a downtrodden society because their parents were bad. And there starts to be this theological revolution that says, I can't do this anymore. That's not, that's not a God worth worshiping if, he's gonna, if God is going to punish us for centuries for sins of people we never met. So. One of the biggest contradictions in the Bible for me has always been when people talk about the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Uh, that's correct. And somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, what was the first contradiction you were aware of? I said it was Joshua and Jesus. If, which is Joshua says, God kills our enemies, and Jesus says, love your enemies. Um, I, I, I do want to just push back on this a little bit because I have heard this quite a bit, and it, uh, I'm not trying to call someone out who submitted this question. Um, I, I think that this is a bit of an oversimplification because there is moments of a very vengeful God in the New Testament, uh, just like there is in the Old Testament. There's also a very grace-oriented God in the Old Testament that's, that's also found in the New Testament. For instance... God is very vengeful in Acts 5 when God um, kills Ananias and Sapphira for withholding money from the church. God just instantly kills them, and that's in the book of Acts. The entire book of Revelation is basically Joshua 2.0. Um, and so, like, th that's like a very vengeful God where God is riding on a horse and slaughtering people. In the Hebrew Bible, um, I mean... There's, there's a lot. Leviticus 19 talks about how the whole call of Israel is to be a holy nation, and one of the prevailing characteristics of a holy nation is one who is welcoming to immigrants, and there is no distinction between an immigrant and a natural-born citizen. So um, that's what God says is like the priority. And so I, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is um, some nuance in that question. At the same time, I don't, I don't blame anyone who asked that question because I think it's a question worth asking. What is the impact of the Bible's contradictions for the things that have been taught as the promises of the Bible? So 
<laughs> I love this question um, because when it comes to the promises of the Bible, there are some promises that aren't actually in the Bible that we tell ourselves are in the Bible. Um, and that depends on, you know, kind of what, what promises we're talking about. But there's this idea, like, for instance, Jeremiah 29 is like a promise from God that, you know, God knows you in the womb before you were born and God, you know, knit you together. Um, and that's considered to be a promise. And that's great. And I, I want to say I really believe that all of us are made in God's image and that's important for us to believe. I think it gets more interesting when you look at the context of it because Jeremiah is writing those words who are to people who are living in exile. And they are living in exile and he is telling them that, yes, it's no fun living in exile in Babylon, but God knew you from the beginning, which is very powerful and is another promise of God. But it keeps going. What's beyond that is he then goes on, he being Jeremiah, goes on to say, um, hey, stop trying to live or live your life in a way that you were expecting to get out of exile because you're probably not. So why don't you build houses and start gardening and start loving your life in exile because this might be as good as it gets. Now, that's a very defeatist attitude or a very hopeful attitude based on your perspective in life. But then all of a sudden you realize that there is something contradictory in that promise that seems to be so rock solid. And it only takes just a few verses to get there and realize it. So I would say with all of the promises that you value, um, first of all, make sure they're in the Bible. Once you find that they're in the Bible, just start looking at the context around, and it's not very long before you arrive at a contradiction in some way, shape, or form, because the Bible is littered with them, and it's kind of beautiful. Why do you like the King's account better? Because Chronicles is just propaganda. Um, <laughs> uh, Chronicles, is, the whole idea is to reclaim the centrality of the temple. And so it wipes away all of David's sins because, you know, David and his son Solomon built the temple, right? Um, and so, like, all the stuff that David did that was bad is gone from Chronicles. So because they want to make sure that the temple has a sterling reputation. The temple is rebuilt at this point after it has been destroyed. And um, everything, everything that's written in Chronicles is to try and tell the readers, like, um, we know that God is still with us or that we know that we're still the people of God because we have the temple. So it's like propagandistic in nature. However, I do like it more in some instances like the story of Josiah um, because I do think it gains greater perspective. But that's, um, that's why I like uh, Kings better than Chronicles because Chronicles is very, very, um, very agenda-driven. Well, I mean, Kings is pretty agenda-driven, but uh, it, it, it's a little bit more fair in the way it cap captures historical events. What else does God expect of us beyond who believeth in me to have eternal life? Um, I think that God only expects you to be you. I, I, I think that if we really believe in justification or, or salvation by faith, that means that you can't really do anything to make God love you more. It means that you can't become more saved. It means like there's just a limit and God's already at the limit. I think it's been helpful. I heard, I can't remember the preacher's name, but I heard a preacher once say that um, uh, Christians often go to the cross of God and see him hanging on the cross. And they say to Jesus, they say, could you give a little bit more? And Jesus looks back and says, I have nothing more to give. Like God loves you to God's fullest capacity. And I think that we have this idea that we need to be productive in our Christianity. And I want to release anyone here that's feeling that. You don't have to be a better Christian. You just have to be you, whoever that is. So uh, should we do a lightning round? How much more do we have, Thomas? A bunch. A bunch. Let's do a lightning round, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up with one more question. But let's do the right, lightning round first. What's a lightning round? Well, just ask the questions quickly. I'll answer oh, the okay. questions quickly. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 that was a lot of information. Your point was that change in the is that change is the tradition, right? Why does that matter? Yeah, that's the most ambitious video of the bunch. Um, I don't know if the point came across. I get really nervous watching these videos in front of y'all because it's like my soul is being bared. So it's like it's a terrifying experience. It's way scarier than speaking. Um, but it's the most ambitious video. I don't think it's the best one. I think it's the most ambitious though, and I kind of I kind of think it's adorable in how ambitious it is. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, real quick question, why does it matter? It's that song that we just sang. Um, there are days you believe it. There are days it's very clear. There are days you don't believe in God at all. Um, and then there are days that you come back to that belief. And all of that is part of the biblical tradition because it's that wide, it's that broad, and it's that loving. Are we all just guessing at God's intentions? If so, why put any... Stock. Stock. Uh, yes, we are. And sometimes those intentions make sense to us, and sometimes they, they last with us for a lifetime. Other times those guesses last for a day, and it's like, oh, that doesn't actually work. Um, it's all kind of messy um, and three steps forward and two steps back at times, and that's why it's important to pay attention to these in the Bible. Would it be too cynical to say that biblical authors and theologians today impose an agenda while interpreting God and events? Yeah, and I hope that you know I bring an agenda too. Um, I'm not perfect, and I'm biased, and I have my own things that I think are important, and I think that as long as we can all admit that we have agendas and we all admit that we have biases, um, we're good. And the minute somebody says, I don't have an agenda, just know you probably shouldn't listen to anything else that comes out of their mouth. <laughs> Does the Nico story imply there are biblical stories that we don't have records about? Uh, of course. Um, there's a chance that, you know, Paul wrote more letters than we have, uh, but this is not meant to be the authoritative end-all, be-all word of God. Uh, there is a much bigger life beyond the Bible um, as told by the people who are here. So we'll do two more quick questions, and then we'll go to the last question. All right. Who was the intended audience for Kings and Chronicles? So for Kings, it was the people of Judah who were living in exile or just out of exile after their kingdom collapsed because it was trying to say, answer the question, how did we end up in exile? And the answer was, well, our kings were bad. Um, you know, society loves to blame their politicians, so Kings is no different. Uh, Chronicles is trying to answer the question 300 years later to the same people, to Judah, when they're asking the question, are we still the people of God? The theological presupposition that God punishes later generations for their elders' wrongdoing is repeatedly implied throughout Scripture. It is also con concrete, uh, <laughs> uh, controversial. Controversial. What? Oh, Contradictory. this. Yes. Yes, yeah, and, there, and in my opinion, actually, I think the United States of America needs to go back to the fact that we, are, we need to pay attention to the sins of our ancestors, particularly white male Americans like myself. Um, it's funny how white male Americans love the, the doctrine of original sin, and then the minute you start talking about the implications of slavery or multiple, gener multiple generations, they say, well, I, I didn't own slaves. It's like, there's got to be some crossover there, guys. Um, so I think we got to do better. We, I, I, when I say we, white male Christians have to do better at accepting the sins of the people who came before us and understanding how that has played out in society today. Thank you. That's a hard one on the lightning round. <laughs> All right, this is the last one here. Okay. How can we come alongside family and friends who have no desire to accept seeing the Bible the way we do at Paradox? I am beginning to despise them all because <laughs> <laughs> they're so close-minded, which makes life hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a, last what a last question. Oh, my friends, it's not your job to save your family. It's not your job to save your friends. It is the Holy Spirit's job. And what I mean by that is there are some times that you can't change people's minds, and that's okay. All that you can do is learn how to love them in the context they're in, and that sometimes that love requires you to cut them out of your lives, and it's painful, it's terrible, but sometimes that's where we have to go. And so my hope is that you don't feel like you have a better or superior understanding of the Bible than the people around you with this work. My hope is that this helps you to see that God is bigger and grander and more inclusive and more loving and just more beautiful than any words could describe. And that would hopefully give you the heart to see something in their journey that would give you a little bit more empathy and I will tell you the best way to change people's opinion is through empathy, even though you may not want to empathize with them. 
But I also want to release anyone here who's feeling like they've tried everything they can to help someone along and they just won't go there. It's not your job to save them. It's the Holy Spirit's. So live as authentically as you can. Live with as much love as you can. And then you will be living an inspired life just like these biblical authors were inspired so long ago. Thank you all for your beautiful questions and for being part of this church.